Good evening and welcome to the engineering portion of this evening's event. Now by engineering I mean that pursuit in which people creatively conjure up a vision for the world in the future. And then, they don't stop there, they go about making it real. And the way that is now is the real world is a connected world with many beautiful and wonderful engineering and science artifacts in it. We have seen two of them already. We can stare to the far reaches of other galaxies and we can peer down so that things like insects look like monsters. But the technology that connects them is electronics. The thing that makes them connected is electronics. And so we have decided to connect electronics into our engineering qualification. And that starts in October. But the interesting thing about electronics is it doesn't just connect equipment, it also connects people. And that's a very important thing uh, if you live on the opposite side of the world to your family, for example. Uh, and also very handy if you're um, developing remote labs. But the um, critical question that arose at this point in our minds was, if the real world is a connected world, how do you go about preparing an engineer for that connected world when we have a history and a proper and right history of thousands of years of poking and prodding at things that are in the same room as you? But that's not the world that we face anymore. You can do more, you can be more effective if you can control things remotely. So we started thinking about what type of equipment we might want our students to interact with and where that equipment might be and where might they be. And so we have some examples that uh, we uh, you know, considered for the sake of hypothetical uh, analysis. And one of them is this amazing dance, a ballet of uh, robots at the Oxford um, factory. I believe this is the Oxford factory. And in this case, the equipment is quite close to the operators, but the operators are staying well back because those orange arms go awfully fast. At the other end of the spectrum, you can put something so far away in space that you couldn't go near it even if you wanted to. So what's right for us? I think it comes down to reaction time. And the critical thing here is we're human, and humans do all of this technology to do things that help humans. And the human time scale is how quickly we can react to something. So as this person is giving away by the look on their face, they haven't done particularly well at this reaction test. Uh, but the point is that if you um, take your friend and they hold a ruler and then they drop it and you, with your fingers at the start of the ruler, grab it, not a much time goes by, but certainly um, a finite amount. And the effect of that reaction time is that anything that happens quicker than the reaction time is effectively free to you in terms of energy consumption. And this is a point that uh, Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman made in uh, several of his works. Uh, this book, if you can get it, is a maiden Christmas reading, but it will take you more than one Christmas. Um, <laughs> in it, he did a test. I don't, I, to conceive of this was brilliant. Uh, sweeties and quizzes. And with that, managed to prove that if you make someone remember something for a short period of time, they are burning real, genuine energy. And if you've got someone who's busy, like an OU student or an engineer, and you are making them burn real, genuine energy, waiting for your remote lab experiment to work, then you're not doing the best job by them that you could. So the human reaction time sets a limit on how far away our equipment can be. But how far away is that? The answer comes from the light that we use to transmit information around the world. Now, we've all heard of things like the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Stone Age. There is a view that we're in the Glass Age because it's glass that carries that light around the world. And if that light was not carried around the world, we would not be in a connected world. We would not have the lives that we have now. So it's that light traveling around the world that we need to understand. So the next question is, what is the speed of light? And indeed it is fast, but it is not infinitely fast. If I was to drop something onto this desk and at the same time send a photon firing sideways around the world, imagining there were no buildings, the surprising thing is, 
that that photon would get back to this disk having gone 40,000 kilometers around the world before the item hit the disk. And it turns out that that distance is around about the same distance the ruler is going to drop in that reaction test. Through to some complete quirk of physics and cosmological constants and human biology, it turns out that the exact right distance to put equipment for doing remote labs where people don't have to burn real genuine energy waiting for stuff to happen is anywhere on Earth. It doesn't matter. So with that, uh, I started connecting things up to the internet. And it turns out, believe it or not, that the slowest part of the whole procedure is taking good old ordinary photons that are jostling about in our lab and getting them through the camera, through the computer, and onto the network cable. Once we've done that, the speed of light takes over and it really doesn't matter. So the trick to making the remote labs work for engineering was getting the light through the camera and onto the network cable. And that's where those video calls came in before. That's what I decided we would use. So I have a small video um, coming up, but before I do that, I should point out that we actually have stuff littered all over campus, and on the engineering side, we are going to have something like 11 of these racks in one room, and that's just the start of it. So we're going to be doing lots of things in parallel. But that's possible because it's a connected world. Lots of things are connected. That's fine. So I was in a coffee shop in Austin, and I decided I would check the pendulum that was in my house in Milton Keynes while I was doing some development work last year. And this is just a screenshot I took. So if you look at the bottom left of the screen, you'll see a sort of a, uh, a, a red circle. And as I was moving things uh, on that little green arrow at the bottom, uh, the pendulum was responding rather quickly. And in fact, I swear, that pendulum looked better from a coffee shop in the east side of Texas, uh, sorry, Austin, uh, than it has sometimes from other places in Milton Keynes. Uh, it's really, really just outrageously good. Uh, so I'm just play it one more time. Just keep an eye on that little green dial at the bottom, uh, bottom left there. If this will. There we go. As I move it, look at that. That is going all the way across the Atlantic, the control is. And then the camera is picking up what the pendulum is doing and bringing that information all the way back to the coffee shop. And that is right at that human reaction time. So now I'm going to do something incredibly brave because I have connected to the system live in front of audiences from uh, the other side of Austin. Um, we've done it. Uh, we sent someone out to China and gave them the job of uh, presenting the pendulum at a distance. That worked. This is done in Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand. And um, now, I'm going to try and connect from about two feet away. <laughs> Vaguely stressful. So, uh, there we go. There's the web. Right, there's a pendulum app. Now, that is a pendulum sitting in my lab. And now I will do the same thing I did before. I'm going to move that green thing. And there it is wiggling away. So, you might ask, what is a pendulum doing on an electronics course? The reason a pendulum is on an electronics course is because it's in a general engineering degree. And in a general engineering degree, to suddenly throw somebody an entirely abstract world of electronics might be a bit fun. So what I thought was the same stuff that courses through the power that uh, runs our houses, runs our country, is actually it has the same trace, if you plot it out, as what a pendulum does if it starts swinging. So we can take something that's quite concrete, quite visible, and we can set it swinging and we can produce the sine wave. And we can have a student capture that information and then start playing about with the different numbers in here and trying to match up the value that they have extracted from the data and then turned back into a calculation to see if they understand what's going on. And when they've got that, then we can take them into the rest of the stuff we do in electronics. So this bridges them in. And uh, from there, we have lots of other exciting experiments just about to pop through the surface. And I look forward to showing them to you in the future. So with that, I am going to magically go back to the talk and say that you can do real experiments anywhere and the like Nick I got a bit jealous I had to connect to my pendulum whilst flying back to New Zealand at Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs>